Hello, my name is Jill Delaney, and I am the lead archivist in photography at Library and Archives Canada. I am very happy to be introducing this interview between Ms. Leslie Weir, Librarian and Archivist of Canada, and the esteemed Canadian photographer, Gabo Silashi. Over the last four years, I've been working with Mr. Silashi and many of my LEC colleagues on a major acquisition of his work, including approximately 80,000 negatives covering his entire career, as well as 41 prints, and on preparing this collection to be accessible to the public. Gabor Silashi was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1928. His mother died in a Nazi concentration camp, and his brother and sister both died of illness during the Second World War, leaving only Gabor and his father, Sandor. He enrolled in medical school in 1948, but an attempt to flee the new communist regime in 1949 led to his imprisonment for five months and left him blacklisted from pursuing further education or a profession. He found manual work and spent some of his free time at the Alliance Francaise, where he discovered a trove of photography books and found his future. He bought his first camera in 1952 and started taking photographs of family and friends but also the people and places in and around Budapest. He also took photographs of the Hungarian uprising in 1956 and fled to Austria shortly thereafter. His father followed a few days later, smuggling the negatives with him. The two arrived in Halifax in February, 1957. Immediately diagnosed with tuberculosis, Gabor was in sanatoriums most of his first year in Canada. He spent his time learning French and English and looking through photo essays in the illustrated magazines of the time, such as Life, Perry Match, and Saturday Night. The Silashis initially settled in Quebec City, but Gabor moved to Montreal in 1959 when he found a job as a darkroom technician for the Service de Cinephoto de Quebec. He soon began attending the many art exhibitions, concerts, and poetry readings in the booming Montreal art scene of the time, where he met his wife, the painter Doreen Lindsay. Gabor was quickly promoted at Cinephoto and was given assignments that took him into rural and small town Quebec. Throughout the 1970s, he was drawn back to these places on his own, creating many of the environmental portraits that would launch his career. A largely self-taught photographer, Gabor had a long teaching career at the Cégep de Ville-Montréal and Concordia University, while also pursuing his own photographic projects and various commissions, both in Canada and abroad. Gabor has received numerous awards and honors for his work over the years, including the Governor General's Award for his lifetime contributions to the visual and media arts in Canada in 2010, and the Prix Paulinien Baudois in 2009. Most recently, he became a member of the Ordre des Arts et des Lettres de Québec. His work has been exhibited across the country, in the United States, and in Europe. Library and Archives Canada began acquiring Gabor's prints in 1975, establishing a long-term relationship with the photographer. Previous acquisitions include selections of his portraits from the Ilo Kud and Abitibi regions, a number of prints from his project documenting St. Catherine Street storefronts in Montreal, and five of his panoramic views of intersections also in Montreal. Needless to say, when Gabor called me in 2017 saying he was ready to discuss LAC's acquisition of his negatives, I was thrilled. LAC often acquires specific projects by documentary photographers, but in certain cases, we are interested in acquiring the entire career of particularly important photographers like Gabor. I, along with two colleagues, reviewed the collection and discussed the details with Gabor over a number of visits. To be honest, I was a bit starstruck at first because I have admired his work for a very long time but Gabor and his family were very welcoming, and it was such a pleasure to be able to sit with his prints spread on the table around us and discuss his work in person. It was definitely the highlight of my career. 
to be able to assure Gabor and his family that his negatives would be preserved for the future and to see the work of my various colleagues over the last 45 years come to fruition was a great feeling. And to be able to provide Canadians and international researchers access to such significant collections as this is what being an archivist is all about. The lockdowns of the last year and a half have delayed making the entire collection available to the public, but we still wanted to share this wonderful acquisition with you. I hope you enjoy this conversation between Leslie Weir and Gabo Silashi. Thank you, Jill. Um, hello, Gabor Slashy. It is so nice to meet you. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to do this interview with me. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the traditional unceded territory of the Ana Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land, and I invite our viewers to take a moment to acknowledge the territory on which they live. The Signatures interviews are unique encounters with key Canadian personalities who have donated their archives to Libraries and Archives Canada, and we hope to discover hidden treasures in the collection along the way. So let's dive right in. You have had an impressive career, and you've had much recognition across Canada and throughout the world. In the introduction, Jill mentioned that LAC has been collecting your work since 1975 when we first acquired some of your prints. The most recent acquisition contains approximately 80,000 negatives covering your life and career as a photographer since the 1950s. Having the negatives at LAC will allow researchers from around the world to access all of your images for a wide variety of research purposes. So what does it mean to you that your life's work is part of Canada's National Archives? Well, I'm, I'm very proud that the uh, uh, Library and Archives uh, accepted my uh, collection of photo uh, negatives because uh, in the last uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years, I started to wonder what's going to happen to my, my negatives, my work. And uh, library and archives called me um, once a year, asking me uh, what's happening, what's your decision. And then finally, uh, in, uh, when was it, in 1975, was it, uh, I said, uh, Yes, I'm interested to have my collection of negatives deposited at the library and archives. So I'm very proud and very pleased. And I also, uh, since the library and archives are uh, in uh, every, every province basically has a, a, a kind of a library. Uh, so my photographs would be available if anybody in, uh, in any of the provinces would do something with my negatives, organize an exhibition or, uh, or a discussion. Uh, and that pleases me very much. I had the opportunity to see some of your prints and negatives that make up uh, the Gabor Salashi um, collection at LAC. And I have to say, it's incredibly impressive. Um, I uh, am actually an alum of uh, Concordia University and I have been very aware of uh, you and uh, your important uh, photographic uh, collections uh, over decades and to have the opportunity to see an incredible range of your interests in terms of architecture, in terms of rural and small town Quebec, in terms of St. Catherine Street, um, one of my uh, old hangouts from uh, my younger years. Um, it was just so amazing to see you representing um, 
uh, your, your experiences over time and, and see how things have evolved and changed. So, but let's go back to the beginning of your career just for a moment. You bought your first camera at the age of 24 while you were still living in Hungary. So what sparked your interest in photography? I was basically interested in photographing my friends, uh, the CDR excursions in the mountains in Northern Hungary, in, in the high mountains of uh, the Tatra Mountains in Slovakia. And I didn't really have a particular theme to work on. I just photographed what, what, what pleased me, what I found uh, important for me, my friends, my family. And uh, this is how I started the whole thing. I bought my first camera, which was a Russian camera, Zorki. And uh, I still have it, and it, it worked very well. It had a very, an excellent lens, very sharp. And that helped me a lot to express my interest in, in photography. And we have some of the negatives uh, and a few of the prints that you took back in Hungary in the uh, early 1950s. Um, you were actually in Hungary uh, during the uprising against the post-Second World War communist regime in October, November 1956, and you actually took some photographs of what was going on around you. Did, did you actually have a sense at the time that you were documenting such an important moment in history? Well, this was the first time that I... I, I started photographing on a specific theme and I made a number of photographs during the uprising and I, yes I felt it that uh, I'm doing something uh, photographing an event that was an important event in the history of uh, Hungary of, of Budapest because uh, the uprising started in Budapest and uh, <clears throat> I exposed about not very many photographs, maybe a, a roll and a half, you know, about, I don't know, 40, 45 photographs of the event. And uh, I, I, I didn't actually photograph the uh, shootings going on because I was very careful. But um, <clears throat> I really found that uh, I should contribute somehow through my photographs to the recording of, of the uprising. When you and your father fled Hungary shortly after the Soviet military suppressed the uprising, your father smuggled some of your negatives in the diaper of a friend's baby. <laughs> Um, what did it mean to you that your father managed to save some of those negatives and, and bring them with him? Well, I, I somehow felt that my, my father um, recognized uh, the value of my photography. You know, I didn't have any exhibitions or anything, but... Uh, uh, and I felt that my, it was important for my <clears throat> father to um, bring out my negatives. And it just happened that uh, I uh, fled with a friend of mine, his name was Andre Libik. Uh, to, we took a taxi to the, uh, the border, the Austrian border. And my father followed us with uh, Andre's baby, and we met in Vienna. And that's how he brought out my negatives in the diaper of the baby. Wow, um, your your father must have felt that those negatives and pictures uh, were 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 important and and should be saved. And 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 I guess it was something of an endorsement of. Uh, 
that he approved you of you as a photographer and um, you know wanted to be sure that your early work uh, was able to uh, be brought out to the West. So oh. once you arrived in Canada, you continued to take photographs. And uh, as Jill mentioned, you were soon hired by the Office de Film du Québec and you were sent on an assignment uh, into rural and small town Quebec. And throughout the 1970s, you were drawn back to these places on your own where you created some wonderful environmental portraits, which uh, did launch your career as a professional photographer. David Harris, who published a book on your work entitled Gabor Slashy, the, La the Eloquence of the Everyday, has said of your work, the historical value of his photographs as a visual record of contemporary life rests not merely with an astute choice of subjects, but on the perspicuity of his observations and the transparency of their presentation. So what was it about rural Quebec that so captivated you? Everything. <laughs> I, you know, I was brought up uh, in Budapest, a large city, and I always, when I stayed, when I was brought up, I, I was a city sneaker. And the only times when we went out to the country with my friends was uh, excursions to go swim in the Lake Balaton and just uh, enjoying life. But when I came to Quebec and they sent me out to the countryside to do uh, reportages, um, I was my, really my first time that I found out what the agriculture is, how uh, peasants worked in, uh, in the countryside, uh, how they lived. Uh, I, I found out about the architecture, interiors, and really everything interested me. So you arrived in Montreal in 1959, and since then, the city has played a rather prominent role in uh, some of your best known projects. The collection includes thousands of photographs of both people and places in the city, ranging from your street photography, capturing city's residents, the portraits of artists and friends, and the clients of Les Impatients. To your uh, views of uh, Boulevard du Carie, uh, your intersections project, and of course, your extremely well-known St. Catherine Street photographs. All in all, it makes a wonderful documentary heritage of the city spanning more than five decades. And I have to say that these uh, are near and dear to me because uh, Montreal is my hometown. So I'd like to delve into some of the projects behind the prints that are now in the collection of Libraries and Archives Canada. So this photograph is from your St. Catherine Street project, which spanned from 1977 to 79 with revisits in 1989 and 1999 to re-photograph specific buildings. So what inspired you to take on documenting this one street in Montreal, and to go back to it years later, what was it about St. Catherine Street that you wanted to capture in your photographs? Well, St. Catherine Street was uh, the most important uh, commercial artery in, in Montreal. And I decided um, to photograph the entire street not every building, but the buildings that I like, that went from Westmount to uh, the Far East on, on Bio Street. And <clears throat> I decided to do this project with a large format camera, a four by five inch uh, U camera. And I set up the camera on uh, the sidewalk to photograph the uh, the building across the street with a 
normal lens was about the right distance. And uh, I, I photographed the buildings that I found interesting, partly because of the signs. Signs I found were really, for me, important because it had to do deal with language and, uh, and visuals. So I took about 150 photographs of St. Catherine Street um, uh, with this uh, new camera. And uh, <clears throat> I edited them uh, because uh, it happened that, for instance, I set up my camera, I focused and made the composition, and then suddenly a, a truck came and uh, stopped right in front of uh, uh, the building I was photographing. So I was patient, you had to be patient as a photographer, and finally they left, or I just came back again to photograph the building because I found it very important. So uh, this was a project that I liked very much. And also um, because St. Catherine Street is an um, east-west street, uh, the light was always good uh, in the morning and then later in the afternoon. And uh, that also uh, this made my decisions. I remember that when I was photographed um, uh, on the corner of uh, St. Catherine and uh, Berry Street, Harshambo Music Store, which you probably remember. And uh, I set on my 4 by 5 inch camera on a tripod with a black cloth right in the middle of the intersection. And this was um, the end of September, October, and you could uh, judge by the shadow that it, it was in the afternoon, the direction of the shadow, uh, shadow of the person. And uh, <clears throat> As I was ready to expose the film, a policeman came and asked me to please sir, move you, move away, you can't uh, just stay here in the middle of the intersection. And I, I told him that, sir, it took me exactly 30 seconds to make a photograph, just to insert my negative uh, order, and then to my surprise, he stopped the traffic in both directions. I did it in 30 seconds and I moved away. So I said, bravo, there are still very nice policemen around. So oh, it's, it's, it's so lovely to hear sort of the, the story behind, um, you know, an iconic photograph uh, like that. Um, you did in 1980 and 81 make a series of panoramas of intersections in Montreal using a camera that produces an 18, eight, an eight inch by 20 inch negative. So, and even though these photographs are still documenting the city of Montreal and its streets, the resulting images are very different. Was there something different you were trying to express about the city with these panoramas? Uh, yes. Um, I acquired uh, borrowed this camera from a friend of mine, I forget his name now, uh, lived in New York City, and um, he showed me this camera, and I asked him, may I borrow it for a few months? He said yes, so I, I came back to Montreal, and I was looking for uh, uh, corners where parallel streets are uh, diagonally uh, uh, cut through the uh, uh, street. It's a little bit like in New York where Broadway goes diagonally crossing uh, parallel streets. So I, I enjoyed this view of uh, 
two streets coming together. And I was still interested in photographing people in, in, in these intersections. Uh, they were mostly uh, uh, just uh, west of Saint Denis Street, and Guilford was the uh, diagonal street uh, cutting through. And uh, <clears throat> and I, I waited for people to um, children to come around and uh, play and uh, and cars uh, cars going by. And then there was another intersection on the corner of uh, San Laura and Van Or, which is totally different. But I saw that photograph in a film. Uh, but I really enjoyed this view where uh, there's a warehouse in the middle of the, uh, the image and uh, a bridge on the, on the left of the image and and a bridge uh, of Saint Laurent Street going across and I I remember seeing this uh, intersection in the film so that's why I photographed it and uh, <clears throat> I enjoyed working with this very large camera it took uh, two tripods to uh, uh, hold uh, the camera itself and then the lens was so heavy that I had to put another tripod in front of the camera to hold up the front of it. That's that's a, a very interesting story and 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 um, of course cameras uh, at that time were a little bit different than they are now and so to hear about the uh, heavy lens and and the way you uh, came up with an approach to be able to capture these iconic intersections yeah. uh, and you know most interesting to our viewers i photographed i i continued this project when i went to poland and also in in, in, uh, in budapest and, and in montreal but there i used i didn't have this camera anymore so i used the two four by five inch negatives uh carefully um, lined up and composed and this is how I made my panoramas but it was basically a diptych but very closely together framed in the frame in one frame so I, I continued the project so there are a few images in the LAC collection of your Lux project um, which are color photographs of electrical and neon commercial signs taken at dusk. These images are once again so different from your earlier views of Montreal and its architecture, including your use of color and light. What was it about these signs that made you want to dedicate a project to photographing them between 1982 and 1984? Well, it was, uh, to start with it for, for the signs, and as I mentioned before, signs, they are basically about language. And also I found that the signs were very beautiful around dusk when there was still a little bit of daylight to, uh, you could see the architecture itself, and the signs were already turned on. So I waited for this moment, which doesn't, didn't take, especially later in the fall. I had about five, 10 minutes to find just the right balance between daylight and, uh, and the signs being turned on. And uh, I used color because, uh, because they were very colorful and uh, it was one way of, of uh, get away from uh, black and white photographs into color, which I then used later in, in other projects. So, and, and these were all signs that were designed by the owner of the building. 
And that was also very important for me. So they were very personal, expressing personal tastes and uh, and 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 showing clearly what uh, the business was about. You know, there were some uh, sex shops, for instance, some restaurants, and uh, different companies. So I just continued doing this for about two years. So LAC also acquired several of your self-portraits as part of this latest acquisition. Many of many photographers are comfortable only behind the camera, but um, you do appear very comfortable when you appear in front of the lens as well. Why has it been important to you to document your life through self-portraits? Uh, because <clears throat> first I wanted to see what what do I look like in a photograph? And I took many of these photographs with my family. Family is very important for me. But I, I did also other self uh, uh, portraits. And basically, it was a, just a curiosity to what do I look like on an 8 by 10 sheet of film. And uh, I had to do uh, the ones I see now with my books uh, in the mirror. And in many different situations, I photographed myself. Uh, I didn't really have a particular uh, purpose for that. I was just, it was really curiosity. And I find it important too for uh, for people when I get older and won't be around anymore to see how I saw myself. So that was one of the reasons. I have to say this one of you uh, reflected in the mirror amongst the books is, is one of my favorites. Um, I'm not sure if that's, you know, the fact that I'm a librarian and I've had a lifelong relationship with, with books. Um, but uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful photograph. Um, we've also scoured the collections at Libraries and Archives Canada, and we've actually found out that you've popped up in the collections of a number of other photographers, um, as well as a subject in some of their photographs. These are photographs of you taken by Sam Tata. There are also photographs of you taken by Arno Meggs. And here's a photograph of you taken by Tony Hauser. There are also some daguerreotype portraits of you created by Mike Robinson. I, I, I found these photographs taken of me by other photographers. Uh, very important, and uh, <clears throat> for instance, Mike Robinson's photograph with the daguerreotype, which I've never seen before. There were other photographs taken of me um, with, with other old 19th century techniques, but uh, never with the daguerreotypes. And, um, <clears throat> I just found the, uh, the whole process uh, very instructive and very interesting. With, uh, with Arno Mack, who was a very good friend, and we stayed with Arno uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and Spring uh, very often and we were in New York, so he was a very good friend. And um, and Sam Tata also was a very good friend, and we photographed each other many times. And that was also very important for me. And um, you mentioned the name uh, portrait photographer 
in Toronto, what's his name? Um, uh, was it Tony Hauser? Yes, yes. Yeah, this photograph, yeah. Uh, the way he chose this uh, background under the Turcot interchange, which is now taken down with my camera. And uh, I, I like very much this photograph. So anyway, I, I like uh, to be posed for other photographers. Yes. And it, it was rather retro of you to be involved in the daguerreotypes, because of course, that was photography process widely used in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, and I'm sure our viewers know that it consists of a unique image on a silvered copper plate. Um, so that that must have been, you know, an interesting experience to actually have your portrait created in a way that was from more than a hundred years before. Yes. So I'd like to close by asking you your thoughts about the future of photography. Um, with the move to digital photography uh, and pretty well everyone now having a camera with them all the time, um, often in terms of having a telephone with them, uh, what do you think the future of professional photography looks like? Well, I don't think there's a huge difference about uh, silver photography and digital in the sense that, of course, it's much easier to work with a digital camera. You take many, many photographs, hundreds of them without costing you any money. But what, what I think won't change is the content of, of the image of, um, if I can say, uh, perhaps a social uh, message. And uh, but content won't change. You know, if you're an artist, professional or amateur, then you, you look at your photographs, what you did yesterday or two weeks ago or uh, just a few minutes ago and you will work with those photographs you uh, some people keep everything i even if i use my digital camera i look at them and i i eliminate eliminate the ones i i don't care where, where, where the uh, uh the content is not important enough. Um, so, in that sense, photography or film or any visual uh, visual uh, uh, technique, uh, it's still the content that is very important. It has been wonderful to speak with you today and hear more about your uh, processes, your photographs, and what inspired you. So I would like to thank you so very much, Gabor Silaski, for this great conversation. And mostly I would like to thank you for trusting Libraries and Archives Canada with your work. Mm -hmm. We are thrilled to have it as part of our national collections. And we know that it will inspire not only researchers and photographers and historians uh, for decades and centuries to come. So thank you so very much for being with me here today. And thank you so very much for trusting us with your fabulous collection. Thank you very much for your interest in my photography and for doing this uh, interview. Goodbye.